I think the bees are our teachers. We've got to bring the bees into the city so that they can help teach us to bring about abundance. People are always interested in, in bees in the backyard. We have the River West Garden Tour, so there's always a week in the summer when uh, there are many people walking by and they look over the, at the, the bees and um, are always asking questions about them and they want to get a closer look. How do you get bees? Uh, would you recommend that we get bees? It sounds like a good idea if you have a backyard to why not have bees, just like a garden, right? It is a lot more difficult than it seems. I think this is our sixth season now. This uh, building that we're on top of right now is a old bowling alley, a four lane bowling alley. So it was supportive enough where we could put a rooftop garden in, which is one of the things I always wanted to have and tie with in connection with my restaurant. And then with having a garden, having things, flowers, plants, we need pollinators. So bees was the next step to actually accomplish that, that goal. I think I always wanted to get into beekeeping. I, I always had an interest in keeping bees. We had hives up here from a number of years ago, and the hives were empty when I started working here. And so when I saw the empty hive up here, I saw it as an opportunity for me to learn personally, but then also to kind of bring some life back into a space that, you know, it was sitting empty for a year or two. It all started uh, me working in a basement of a strip mall for 10 years. Um, and then when we moved locations, we came above ground and I wanted to have nature. I wanted to look out a window. I hadn't looked out a window at work um, ever. So adding the bees was just kind of, it kind of clicked and we got that whole ecosystem out there. <laughs> I'm a resident here. I'm the resident beekeeper and I'm heavily involved with the landscaping here as well. The residents here are more on the progressive side and those of us that were working on the outside, we felt maybe uh, it would be nice to bring bees to St. John's. It was about seven years ago. I'm an auditor for the state of Wisconsin. I had to drive around in different counties and I was listening to a talk radio program and they were talking about how taking in local honey helps you to build immunity to allergies because you're taking in the pollen from your local area that you're allergic to. Any honey in the city of Milwaukee is not local. Local is about 50 miles from where you live. A lot of honey that we get is from up north. I figured I'd take a look at what I could do and there was a class at UW Extension. I took that and went from there. I began my ministry here 10 years ago and when I started this church was in the bottom trough of its downward descent. So one of the people that we met along the way, Dr. Katherine Wilson and I, we walked onto the rooftop and kind of looked at each other and said, what could this be used for? How could we use this space? And then she said, what about bees? And I said, well, who will take care of the bees? And she said, I know someone. 
And it wasn't long after that that I met Charlie Keenan of Be Evangelist. If you would have traced my career path, it had absolutely nothing to do with bugs or bees until my late 30s. I was running an Apple tech shop, teaching people to think different about how they do their work. And now I teach people to think different about beekeeping. I was sort of afraid of them, like most people are. And it was because of one beekeeper who showed me the being inside of the hive instead of just the bees themselves. And it was that that hooked me. The minute I was inside the hive and seeing that, I was like, man, this is what I want to do. And so I got out of the business and started to but evangelize. It here, and I it's just been down. that all the way through my career is just how can I spread the buzz about the bees and, and enlighten people about the plight of pollinators. Tree this week. My wife and I, we were at a farmer's market in Cathedral Square, and there was a company there that was starting off making uh, hives. After speaking with them, we found out that you could keep bees in the city, so we looked into it more and figured out what we had to do to get them. The city requires certification, and there are many bee companies that usually make equipment and sell bees that will do the training and, and give you a, a certification. You also have to draw a map out of where it's going to be in your yard. We also drafted a letter and sent it to all of our neighbors, let them know that we had gone through uh, certification and the precautions we were taking, that we'd only have two hives. And we got a, a really positive response. Everyone was actually pretty excited to hear that we were getting honeybees. Just having bees, you know, 30 feet away from our door, I was concerned about that, of course. I have a, a three-year-old now, and she was one then. Dogs, um, you you kind of get worried, you know, are bees going to attack them? Are they are they going to get stung? After a few times out in the backyard, you notice that they're, they're kind of just minding their own business. Typical day with the bees is pretty quiet. I only go into my hives once a week. We call them hive inspections. You're just looking for any signs of disease or parasites. Looking at how well the queen is laying and what she's laying. There are a lot of things that can happen. Last year we had our first swarm. That's when the, the colony kind of outgrows their space or they have a change in command, so a new queen. That usually means that the, the bees will swarm outside of the hive and take off and they were actually in a tree like uh, 20 or 30 feet up there. <laughs> Last year in our five years was the first year we've ever taken honey. For us, it's never been about the honey, so we haven't really taken the steps to push our hives to produce more and more honey. We usually let them keep what they've made. We're, you know, taking bees and putting them somewhere we want them to be, trying to make them do things we want them to do, like produce honey or, or stay in the box. That's challenging because they're, you know, they're living creatures and they have natural instincts. There's also uh, disease and, and parasites. In the city, pesticides that are put on lawns, those can be pretty detrimental to you know, one or two colonies in a yard. All of those things make it a little more challenging than you would you know, expect. There's a really robust community in Milwaukee, in the city of Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, that will pair you up with a mentor and, and get you through your first year, your second year until you're mentoring someone else. So I, I definitely would recommend it to people, but I would always uh, tell them the, the hardships of it and uh, to get a mentor. When someone contacts me and they want to learn beekeeping, the first thing I ask them is, why do you want to be a beekeeper? I get several different answers. Kind of a common answer is people say, I want to save the bees or I want to help the bees. The European honeybee is not a native to Wisconsin. We have over 500 species of bees here that actually need assistance. It's a lot of work, and a lot of times when I explain to them all the work that's involved, I never hear from them again. Some people are intrigued by the science of it, and some people say they want honey. I'll invite them out to one of my hives and say, okay, I'm gonna get your hands dirty, I'm gonna get you in this hive, and you're gonna decide if you wanna do it. When you take this box and put it in your backyard, you're making a deal with these bees that you're gonna be their doctor, their landlord, their grocer, they're gonna take care of them. 2010, Milwaukee passed an ordinance that you can have up to two hives in, on your property. 
Each municipality has its own ordinance. In the city, you have the medians, they plant things there. We have city gardens, vegetable gardens, flower gardens and everything. Having bees kind of helps those flowers and vegetables produce. You have certain responsibilities having a hive within the city, and one of those is uh, respecting your neighbors. Bees are two things, they're an organism and they're a superorganism. An organism in that the way they produce is one egg at a time with the queen. A superorganism is the entire colony. The way the superorganism reproduces is it splits off. They decide that that original queen and two thirds of the bees are gonna go find a new home and expand while this colony continues to grow. The bees, when they look for a new home, sometimes it's in people's walls. So that's one of the responsibilities you have. You could wear all the protective gear you want to. Um, you're going to get stung eventually. And just my opinion, I don't think you're a good beekeeper unless you get stung. But uh, it's kind of a badge of honor. We're, we're not normal people. <laughs> we are looking for that queen. The queen does not feed herself. She doesn't use the bathroom for herself. This is an egg laying machine between 1,200 to 2,000 eggs a day. Bees don't make honey for us. That honey is for them. They make the honey so that they can make it through the winter. Going in the hive, taking out the frames is in essence like us going into the refrigerator, taking out the food. We want to make sure we leave enough for them so that they make it through the winter. Bees go out and they collect nectar and they spit it into another bee's mouth. They do that a couple times. Then finally they spit it into a cell. And when the cell's full, they cap it over. The buzzing that you hear, that's them fanning it, drying it, and it gets thick and it becomes honey. You use an uncapper and you scrape the caps off. You run it past here and remove the cap. And then you got the honey exposed and you put it into an extractor. It's like a big centrifuge and it throws the honey out. I run hives within the city of Milwaukee. I teach people with boxes how to think like beekeepers. In addition to running my own hives, I have about 20 hives right now. This is a little side thing that I do, a little side business I run in addition to my full-time job. The hotel's probably unique because there's no more in Milwaukee. I'm the only one that does that there. And what they were going to do was make some rooftop gardens up on top of the space where they have the hives so that he, they could produce locally sourced food. Having a beehive completes the whole process of a garden because when people see that you have a functioning hive in your, on your land with your, with your gardens, with your vegetables, they know that your food is clean because they know pesticides kill off bees. This is the rooftop garden. I manage the garden, the bees, the worms, and try to come up with uh, any more sustainable projects that can uh, keep a more closed loop system for the food system here at Braze. So we started 10 years ago uh, as a restaurant. Prior to that, we were a traveling culinary school started in 2004, where we would go to farms and do farm dinners right in the uh, farm field. So we have the utmost connection with our farmers and kind of that farm to table mantra. I take uh, food scraps from the kitchen, take it, uh, feed it to the worms, then the worms turn it to the compost, that goes to the plants, and then the plants start flowering, the bees come and do their thing. We can grow about 700 pounds of greens and herbs in a year and having the bees here pollinating that continually is a great way for our production to be utmost. We'll harvest them continually up here and use them right in the restaurant. As they're helping pollinate the plants for us, then uh, we get the honey and using that in the restaurant as ingredients as well. We'll use the honeycomb on our cheese plates. When people are first presented with a honeycomb, they may not be uh, understanding of what it is. Uh, so we kind of show them and then uh, kind of educate them where it came from, being right above their head in the dining room. And it's really close proximity to our dining guests as well. There's that like, oh, that's a lot of bees. And some, you know, understand it and some don't. We educate them on it. It plays into it really nicely to tell that narrative of be to farm to table. For the most part, people are very receptive of what's happening up here with the bees and in amongst the garden and dining atmosphere. In this very isolated, desolate urban setting, there's not many bees around here to make everything pollinating. And so the more that we can help other businesses and kind of lead the way on that, makes a more robust 
food system, and that's kind of what we're all about. This is one of the urban ecology centers. It's one of three in Milwaukee. And the Urban Ecology Center is an organization in Milwaukee that exists to get people out in our urban green spaces, learning about nature, doing outdoor recreation, and coming together as a community. The main purpose of keeping this, this beehive here is for educational purposes. And because this is also a public space, people can come out here and hang out, sit by the bees, to get uh, members of the public just comfortable cohabitating with flying insects with bees, pollinators. I think that's a very important part of like living in harmony with nature in an urban area is getting comfortable with cohabitating with different forms of wildlife. And they'll open the door and as, as soon as they see the beehive, they'll kind of take a step back and they're not used to being that close with the beehive. And that's actually one of my favorite things about having this beehive up here is because they're very friendly. You know, they're, they're not bugging me, I'm not bugging them. And so getting people comfortable with the idea of like just being in close proximity with an active beehive uh, is a really cool thing. Three Bridges Park, which is just behind us, is really the reason that we are here. It's not only a, uh, a place that we do a lot of our land restoration work, it's an outdoor classroom. We do a lot of field research in this park. It's uh, about 24 acres and stretches from here all the way down to like Mitchell Park. Um, and it's right along the Menominee River Valley. And there's some really special habitats that are being cultivated inside that park. And so, you know, that's, that's the real reason I think we're here is to help kind of be the, the liaison, the bridge, the connection between our community here and uh, this beautiful urban natural space right next to us. It's crucial to have pollinators that are able to pollinate them when their flowers are blooming at their height. There are threats to honeybees. There's, you know, colony collapse disorder, pesticide use, shrinking natural habitats for bees. I think in general, when I think of honeybees, I largely understand them to be agricultural livestock. Most of our honeybee population in this country exists because we cultivate them in order for these bees to pollinate our food crops. And in that sense, honeybees are not endangered because there's so much money and science behind keeping them alive so our food supply can stay fluid. When people talk about bees being endangered, it's really our native bee populations. Those are bumblebees, you know, solitary bees like carpenter bees, minor bees. These are bee populations that aren't kept uh, for commercial purposes and they depend on uh, protected habitats in order to survive. I view these honeybees really as a gateway to, to help youth and families think about um, pollinators more broadly. Uh, you know, it's, it's not often that you're going to kind of stumble across a bumblebee's nest or unless you're really looking for it, you're not often gonna find monarch eggs on the underside of a milkweed. But you come up here and you get an opportunity to stand next to some honeybees, see how they collect pollen, how they pollinate flowers. It might start sparking some curiosity about how other pollinators work and why we need to protect the entire system for our pollinators. Far too often people don't understand that the food they eat, it's more than just something growing on a tree. It's, it's the action of a pollinator or a bee coming to a flower at just the right time that brought that into being. Plight of the pollinators is more to do with the broader aspect of all insect pollinators and the loss that we're seeing of their population because we were looking for why were the honeybees dying? And what we found is that that all of our pollinator populations are in a steep decline and we need to become more aware of their importance because it's through pollination that most of what we have around us has come into being. Bee Evangelist is an organization that I've started that advocates and educates about the plight of pollinators using products and practices surrounding different types of beehives and trying to bring them into community. So we try to find places where people come together. So churches and universities, schools, nursing homes, where we can bring together people and show them bees in a way that they would not have ordinarily been accustomed to seeing them, and then do it in a way that is more geared towards safety and education and advocacy. Everybody always, you know, when you say bees, they ask honey. 
And, and I always try to divert them away that there's much more to it than, than just the honey. There are more pollinators creating abundance and diversity around us and how every third bite of food or most all of the fruits, nuts, berries, and vegetables that we eat are all created by bees. The second question that everybody always seems to talk about is, is um, how they sting and how they're always around their picnics or something. And so it's really important for me to clearly define the difference between wasps and bees. One wasp can sting you many times, whereas a bee can only sting you once. So it, it really doesn't want to sting you, but it will if it feels threatened or feels that you're threatening its family. Whereas a wasp will sting you because it wants your soda or it wants your sandwich or it wants something that you're holding on to. The way I'm doing beekeeping without the masks, without the veil, without that stuff is not typical. There are times in any beehive that I'll be wearing a suit and I might be using smoke. And as I tear apart that house floor and ceiling to look at what I need to, the guard bees sting like crazy. So I wear a suit to protect me from getting stung and I use smoke to stop their communication from being very good. It's not as carefree as I make it out to be. I try to do that just to demystify it and to make it more inviting. It's really important to me that if I'm gonna get in front of people, I do whatever I can to attract attention. And after you've been doing beekeeping in the city as long as I have, you've developed a name, Charby. I made this Charby costume and so when I talk to kids in schools, I'll put on my Charby outfit, um, including the antennas. And then when I go talk to older kids who really don't care about the bee outfit, then I just make sure I bring antennas. And sometimes when we have events, we'll put the wings and antennas on everyone in order to get everybody involved in a passive way of being able to approach a stigmatized creature. In downtown Milwaukee, I've, I've been practicing this um, bevangelizing for a number of years, and, and I try to find these places where people come to. The director of sustainability said, can we put a beehive at Marquette? Um, and we put the bees up there, and they've been up on the roof and proudly displayed in their new um, engineering building. I did the same thing at the Sisters of St. Francis, where I brought in bees because their orchards weren't doing very well and I got their orchards up and running to the point to which they now have to prop up branches because they're breaking under the weight of apples and pears and things that are growing because we've got so much pollination increase by bringing the bees there. Redeemer Church was one of the first places where the pastor here, um, Pastor Lisa Bates Froyland, thought it would be a perfect addendum to the congregation. This church was founded in 1890 with what was then a really unusual idea for Lutherans, that they could worship in English. So you'd have your Danish Lutheran church, your Norwegian Lutheran church, but they didn't mix and mingle together. So this congregation has been an inclusive place by design from the very beginning. About five years ago, started having hives on the roof, up to three one summer. And so when people came to tour the church, they not only looked at this beautiful sanctuary, but they would go up and take a look at the bees as well. Overcoming the fear of the bees it was a really good fit for our overall ministry here, which is also about facing fears, really, and finding grace. One of the ministries that started shortly after I began here was our noon run ministry, which invited anyone who was hungry at noon to come for a free lunch meal. For some people who were in the church or in the neighborhood, a person without a home can seem scary. Uh, they may not look the way that you're expecting them to look or smell or sound. And so being in proximity, sitting down and having a conversation really helped to face and allay those fears. Similarly, um, the bees. The bees are so critical to our survival and yet from fear of bees, there's been great destruction of these animals that we need so, so much. Um, for our food supply. There's this really ugly stuccoed section on the back of the church. So every time I would drive up to work to turn into the parking lot, I thought, oh, that is such an eyesore. 
I wonder if it could be transformed into something beautiful. I said, you know what? I think it'd be cool to put a mural on that ugly stuccoed area. The artist was able to work with the roughness and the ugliness to make it look as if there are bees that are building a hive inside the church. The fact that they're at work in here is another great way of saying we are busy here. This isn't a church that's empty. We're always up to something here and it's a hive of activity for the greater good. Charlie and I worked together to design worship services where bees were the theme and the occasion for us to talk about Christian principles like being a disciple. To have a welcoming space where people can bring their fears and be met by grace is one of our, our greatest missions here. What I found from observing the bees on the rooftop, I could see them going in, going out, going back in, going out, and it reminded me of a church like ours, where people come in, they're nourished with hearing the Word of God, but then the main part of our Christian life doesn't happen here. It should happen out, just as the bees' major activities is to go out and pollinate, bring back the nectar to make into the honey, but most of the work happens outside the hive, spreading goodness and making growth possible. I'm just Sherry Briscoe. I live here. Um, I'm a resident. I uh, take care of this. They call it the Nectar Garden. I like to think of it as a prairie. St. John's has two uh, beehives and they wanted plants that provide nectar for the bees close by. Bees can go far, as far away as five miles to get what they want for their honey. We were hoping to have, and we do have now, nectar resources for them close by, too. If you're careful what you select, it'll help the garden as much as the bees. The plants will be more vigorous. The bees don't have to travel so far. It's a symbiotic relationship. They, they need each other. We've had them now for between six and seven years. So that's a pretty good time period. It was a pretty arduous process. We had to work with the city. You need a permit. Since this is a retirement community, we got about 500 people living here. Certain precautions have to be taken, both by the city and also by management at the retirement facility so that we don't jeopardize residents as far as getting stung by bees. Four or five of us got together, pooled some money, brought in a person who was able to set things up, and then I'm the person who looks after them on a daily basis. It turns out it's pretty easy, they're pretty docile. If you take the time to learn a little bit about bees, uh, you find that they tolerate you. <laughs> they get to recognize you. They have facial recognition. The plan is to keep bees here. People are very proud of the fact that we have them. There are those of us who believe that we need bees in our urban areas because as urbanites and suburban areas spread, they take away the natural areas that were once everywhere. And as those natural areas decrease and the natural plants decrease, our insects don't have the sustenance that they need. We all know that the honeybees are uh, a population that have been really impacted with all of the fertilizers and pesticides throughout the years. And we know that we actually, we can't really change the world around us, but we can change our local community. And we know that bees are a part of the bigger ecosystem. We're so excited to have local bees here and we're actually working really hard to have awesome native plantings around the area as well, so that they'll have plenty of food. And in turn, we'll get to have some awesome honey. Some people were kind of nervous because they're like, well, what if a child goes back there? But we're in a pretty protected space here. The railroad's right across the street. There's really no foot traffic back here. 
But when there is foot traffic back here, it's definitely a surprise for people. They're like, wow, bees. And I think a lot of people have a positive response to that. This is a family business. I'm part of the second generation along with my two sisters. We opened this location back in December of 2020, and it serves as our 10th retail store and our headquarters. You know, we really believe that bikes make the world a better place. Part of making the world a better place is the environment where we live. You know, bikes are good for the environment. They reduce emissions uh, by replacing other trips. And bees are good for the environment. They pollinate, you know, so many of our crops and so many of our flowers. And it's for sure true, like, you go around and you see different people's gardens. The more vibrant gardens are a result of the pollinators. Wheel & Sprocket has been operating in the like suburbs of Milwaukee for the last four decades and we really knew that we wanted an urban space. So we opened up this Bayview location. We wanted to be more than a bike shop. So, you know, yes, we have bicycle retail. Yes, we can fix your bike, but we also have bike nonprofits here. And we also have what we are calling the Joyride Cafe. You can get a cup of coffee or a pint of beer a lot of places in Bayview, but no place can you uh, benefit bicycle infrastructure. So the Joyride Cafe benefits the Chris Kegel Foundation, uh, which is our internal nonprofit that creates bike paths, that helps with bike infrastructure and creates awesome bike events. We have thousands of bees out and back. We'll be able to harvest and actually have honey at the cafe from our local bees here. We have no plans of stopping. It's a lifelong adventure and we're growing and we're you know learning and getting better and adding new elements here and there all the time and you know no idea is a bad idea. We like to try things out. We'll be doing this probably for the rest of our lives. But yeah, it's second nature now. I, don't, I can't see a yard without bees. I hope it, it continues to grow. In the six years we've been doing it, I've definitely seen growth. I'd like to see it evolve as well. There are many different varieties of bees that um, could also use the help. I'd like to see some kind of you know, evolution towards helping the, the feral bees in the community as well. Getting other people of color involved in things like this. I would like to see more of us involved in nature in general. I knew I grew up in the projects and we had concrete everywhere. It wasn't until I got older that I got to see all this nature in general. The, not just the bees, but the plants and, the, and the, just all the green. Realizing kind of almost the language of the bees how almost passive they are, that like, I'm not afraid being around them, like if I just go in calmly and talk to them. They're the laborers for our food, and they're not something to be afraid of. One of the cool things about living in Milwaukee, you know, is the density that we have and sort of this tapestry that we're all part of. The bike shop, you know, I think adds to the vibrancy of our community. I think the beehives add to the vibrancy of our community. So, you know, I'm really excited that this is a place that that adds uh, interest and richness uh, to this place where we love and where we call home. People are becoming more aware that we have bees here. More and more people are planting these native gardens now. It's a beautiful circle, and I want to keep that circle alive. As Milwaukee kind of grows and becomes even more of a, uh, a space where people are learning how to cohabitate with urban nature, that more people understand the importance of pollinators, not just honeybees, but all, all of our insect pollinators, and make little changes around their home and neighborhood that are uh, beneficial for pollinators, whether it's planting native flowering plants or reducing the use of pesticides in their garden or around their home. Um, I think those are the little things that on a small scale might not seem important, but when you look at you know, 600, 800,000 people across Milwaukee, if we're all taking steps to do those things, the pollinators in our city are going to be that much more healthy. The word flourish comes to mind. 
will the neighborhood, will the city of Milwaukee, and will the people who come into this hive think enough about the future and the hopefulness of this community of faith to invest deeply in it. And so my hopefulness is that the fear of bees will continue to decrease as we value their important work among us to help all of us be able to flourish in terms of nutrition, but in also in terms of being connected to all of God's creativity. If you look at a bee, it lives for 30 days, 40 days, and for that time, it only makes a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey, a drop. But it keeps working, and it works together in community, and within community, a hive can produce 200 pounds of honey, one drop at a time. So I think all of us, if we just think about our, our vote, our decisions inside of um, supermarkets, our decisions and what goes into our lawn or our backyard, it's just one vote, it's just one drop, it's just one little bit. But if we all do it together, big things happen.